It's been 20 years. Tibet was so poor when I came the first time. I told my team I might not have access to internet or phone, but I've had incredible speeds for internet. And the big thing was the roads. I thought it was going to be a significantly poorer place than the provinces I've seen in, in the rest of China, and it's not. I personally am very hesitant to work with Chinese state media. There's a, a worry that state media is going to turn me into a puppet. I've been on Chinese state media quite a lot, and nobody has ever told me what to say. I haven't been forced to see certain things. I actually found you were more open than BBC, which often tries to catch me um, with their questions. The Maker Center, and, and I saw it beside the road. I said, can we go there? And you said, well, no problem. I don't like the false narrative that Blinken is perpetuating after Pompeo, and which a lot of U U.S. media are talking about, simply because China wants to create a unified, patriotic country. Genocide. I don't think there's anything like that going on. We should take that term off the table. Who do you think really cares about the Tibetans? The only reason we pe hear people in the West pay attention to Tibet is because they can use it as a way of criticizing China. What's the biggest difference between what you have read from Western media and what you have actually seen here? Everything. <laughs>《I'm Miao, and this is China Chat. In this episode, we invited two Americans to join us on our trip to Tibet. We visited historical landmarks, public institutions, and people's homes to personally see how the locals live, before sitting down to share our experiences and set the record straight about what's really happening here. So guys, what made you interested in joining this episode? I wanted to see Tibet, which is a great opportunity. People from around the world want to see Tibet because they see it as the sort of the most exotic place in the world. How about you, Sean? So for me, um, I first came to Tibet in 2001. So it's been 20 years that I've been here. And I wanted to see the changes because Tibet was so poor when I came the first time. So I came here because I thought it was a really good opportunity to see what changes have been happening in the last 20 years. Guys, I have to ask, did you have any concerns about being invited by state media to Tibet? For me, yes. I personally am, am very hesitant to work with Chinese state media because I want to keep my independence. And there's a, a worry that state media is going to turn me into a puppet and sort of only show me the good parts of Tibet never show me the negative parts and control what I see and control what I say. It took me a while to actually agree to do this episode, but it, it's actually been quite good. I haven't been told what to say. Um, I haven't been forced to see certain things and not see the greater part of Tibet. So it actually, in many ways, you know, I, I do CNN and BBC and a lot of Western media TV shows a lot. I actually found you were more open than BBC, which often tries to catch me um, with their questions with the anchors. Thank you. How about you? No, I, I've been on Chinese state media quite a lot, and nobody has ever told me what to say or restricted what I say or said, don't tell the truth about this. That's, that's just never happened. And I didn't think it would happen this time. Uh, so I wasn't really concerned about that. I agree with Sean that when I deal with the current Western press, they often come in with a narrative or an agenda, and they want you to repeat their agenda. They're just taking you on board so you'll say what they want you to say many times. I, I haven't had that happen here. So when we started planning this trip, we've already asked both of you where you would like to go and what you would like to see. And our itinerary was based on both of your wishes. Mm -hmm. And we also make sure that you get to talk to local people freely. Yeah, I mean, I asked to see um, two things. I asked to see school children and I wanted to see how you know, everyday regular Tibetans live. When we were driving and I said, I wanna stop, you, know, you let me stop and go into a house. So it wasn't a well-managed tour where we only could see what the government wanted us to see. We were able to get around. To say about this trip, we've gone places that we just asked, can we go there? And you weren't prepared for that, so we didn't have any restrictions in, in that regard. The Maker Center in this, in this town, it's a... And I saw it beside the road, and I'm interested in maker centers and innovation. And I said, can we go there? And you said, well, no problem. 
So guys, what did you know about Tibet before this trip and what were you expecting to see here? I didn't know very much. You know, you, you read about a place and until you see it, you really don't know what it's like. For the last month or so, I've been reading histories of Tibet. I really had not expected the level of development that we're seeing here at all. I thought it was going to be a significantly poorer place than the provinces I've seen in, in the rest of China. And it's not. It, it looks very developed and actually I kind of want to move here. I look at how beautiful it is. This is your only first visit. You want to move here? This is the first here? time I've been here, yeah. Well, it's a look at the place. It's so beautiful. Yeah, it's very nice. Sean, you were here 20 years ago. What changes have you seen here? I think for me, the first um, that was most shocking was the investment into infrastructure. So I run a research company and when I came here, I told my team, you probably won't be able to reach me. I might not have access to internet or phone, but you know, you look, there's cell phone towers all over uh, Tibet. I've had incredible speeds for internet. Um, and the big thing was the roads. I mean, the roads the last time I were here, were mostly dirt, it was winding. I remember just getting sick all the time and going, you know, maybe 20 kilometers an hour. This time, you know, it was fast highways connecting Lhasa to all of the little cities that we went to. Um, so I think it was the infrastructure spending that has surprised me the most. I just, I really didn't expect it to be so good. I'd like to add something to that. I, th I think infrastructure spending is a key because it allows people to run businesses. You could not run a business here if you did not have roads and if you did not have good 4G or 5G capability. But now you see people setting up beds and breakfasts, even innovation centers, and they can do that because of the spending on infrastructure. I mean, we saw a, a huge dam that provides electricity, a new railway being built, uh, roads all over the place. I actually spoke with an official and he said to me, Sean, it's really expensive to fix the roads here. It gets cold, it's like negative 20 degrees Celsius during the winter. And actually, in many ways, some of the roads are not used that often because there aren't that many people out here. But we have to do it. This is what he said to me. We have to do it because we have to make the lives of Tibetans better. So the one thing China really gets right that I wish the United States and other countries would learn from is infrastructure spending. In many sort of remote areas of the United States, you cannot get high-speed internet, either by wireless or by wired. Yes. And there's no incentive to provide it. But we're here in a little village in the middle of Tibet, and we've got great 4G connectivity, which is really kind of amazing. Yeah, we really saw that with COVID. So many students weren't able to do home learning because they didn't have access to high-speed internet. Um, so that's one of the failures of the American system, is that they spend so much money on war and on weapons and not enough on roads and telecom and infrastructure. It was just so dirty 20 years ago and people just seemed so poor. Um, I was really surprised at how healthy people looked. So what really surprised me was just how prosperous um, Tibet looks and how everyday Tibetans really seemed healthy. They had access to medical care, they had access to education. That really surprised me. I was thinking we were going to be going, you know, backward in time and Tibet was really going to be left behind the rest of the country. Part of the problem is it's not easy for foreigners to get into Tibet. So we are not able to see firsthand what's really going on. And so the narrative that people like me are presented with in Western media is very skewed. They always talk about as Tibet as being poor or having religious uprisings. Um, so it was really good for me to be able to see what's happening on the ground. And guys, did you have any questions about Tibet that you now have the answers to? I think the first question that I really wanted to know was how well preserved was the Tibetan language? I think it was very clear that the government is doing a pretty good job at protecting Tibetan culture and Tibetan language. So, you know, when we went into a hospital, all of the signs were in Tibetan first and then Chinese, and some of the signs were in English. And when I actually asked the head of the hospital, who is actually a Tibetan woman, she said to me, well, many of the doctors here actually don't even speak Mandarin because they never learned it. And a lot of the patients don't speak any Mandarin. So obviously, we have to see our patients and speak to them in Tibetan. And they actually even showed me 
the um, software that they use to write sort of the, the diagnoses, and that also was in Tibetan. So that part was important to me. Also, when I'm going out into little villages, all of the street signs are still in Tibetan. So it's quite clear that there isn't a policy that's stopping Tibetans from knowing their own language. Now, teaching Mandarin is also very important because that gives more job opportunities for Tibetans to be able to go to other provinces or do business with other people from other provinces. It's important to have a unified common language that everybody in one country, whether it's the United States or whether it's China, where they can all communicate. I saw that happening in Tibet. That's my question that was answered. That same sort of transition happened in European countries 100 years ago. If, if you go back 100, at least 150 years ago, people in northern France and southern France could not talk to each other. But it became worthwhile for people to get the opportunities from knowing standard French. So it's natural for people to want to learn a language that creates economic opportunities from, for them. In China, I think every school in the country teaches English, which, which creates opportunities for people around the world. Students want to learn English. It's not being forced on them because it creates business opportunities for them and lifestyle opportunities. One thing that bothers me is the use of the term genocide. It's a very serious term and it should not be minimized. It should not be used in a minimal way. It's really not killing a culture and it's really not killing a people. I don't think there's anything like that going on. So I think we should take that term off the table. Yeah, I'm an American and I love the United States, but I'm very upset with how former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo said there was genocide taking place in China and how Tony Blinken, the current Secretary of State, has said the same thing without showing any evidence. I've been here most of the last 23, 24 years and I don't like the false narrative that Blinken is perpetuating after Pompeo and which a lot of U U.S. media are talking about simply because China wants to create a unified patriotic country. It's the exact same thing in the United States. When I was a school child in New Hampshire, I had to recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the American flag every single morning. Everybody in the United States, if they want to go to college, has to take the SAT in English. You know, it's just normal to have a lingua franca for people within a country. So after examining Tibet from many different angles, how would you comment on this new Tibet after 70 years of peaceful liberation? One of my regrets is that I did not see China or Tibet or any part of China a long time ago. So I cannot directly say what happened in the change. I, every place I go in China, it looks developed. The highways are great. The infrastructure is great. The 4G is great, much better than we see in any other country. For me, I wasn't here 70 years ago, so I don't know what life was like. But it's clear that life is much better now than it was 20 years ago when I visited. They didn't, the roads were a mess, the life expectancies were short, access to education for females and males were not good. So it's clear that the government here is making the lives better for the vast, vast majority of everyday Tibetans. I mean, that's, you know, you can't, you can't argue that point. You know, life is better for the everyday Tibetan. One of the easiest measures of development is how tall people are. And I noticed that the older people here in Tibet are very short, and the young people we saw at the high schools, they were all tall. That means they're getting enough food to eat and they're healthy. So Sean, how would you tell your 14-year-old son about today's Tibet when you go back? Um, so what I would tell him uh, is that he has to continue to study hard and be competitive because the kids coming out of Tibet are worldly, educated, and they're highly motivated. So for my 14-year-old son, I'd like him to come visit and make friends with the people here and see if they can cooperate because I think Tibet's economy over the next 20 years is really going to boom. What really struck me is it's not only Lhasa. I was really struck by this maker center we saw here in the little village of Lulong. But they have a maker center to teach students, primary students in this village, how to be innovative, how to use computers, how to use uh, 3D printers. 
They use the phrase that means an innovative life, Chuangxing Shanghuo, which means they're teaching, they're, they're creating a spirit of dynamism in the young kids. And that's going to pay off over the next 50 years. These kids will grow up dreaming of being innovators, dreaming of, of building businesses, dreaming of taking advantage of economic opportunities. Yeah. And guys, what's the biggest difference between what you have read from Western media and what you have actually seen here? Everything. <laughs> I, I mean, I think part of the problem, Western media in general takes a very biased narrative of what's happening in Tibet and China. You get a lot of reporters, even from the top tier publications like New York Times and Wall Street Journal, they don't speak Chinese. They don't speak Tibetan. So they're interviewing the sort of same overseas dissidents all the time. And so you get a very skewed view of what's happening on the ground in Tibet. Because I was expecting originally there'd be a lot of repression, there'd be soldiers walking around. We didn't really see that. I think there are two big issues. One is on not only on this issue, but on just about every issue, especially the American press has developed a, their, they push a narrative rather than do research. They have the story written before they show up in a place. And they're gonna write that regardless of what they see, I think. I'm, I'm very down on the current state of the American press. I, I've worked in the press before, and it's very different now than it was 50 they're or 60 objective. years ago. You know, and they don't wanna hear different voices. But because I'm objective, I've been banned. You know, Bloomberg won't quote me anymore. There's a group of editors at the Wall Street Journal who come in and tell reporters to take my quotes out of stories. So I think the US media, they come in with a story. And so they're not looking for the truth anymore. They're not looking for objectivity. Over the last 40 years, the American media is looking at spinning a story. You know, I've posted on Twitter some of the photos of me visiting schools here, and people say, Sean, you're lying. You, you went to the number one Lassa High School where there's 5,000 students, and you showed um, a video of kids learning Tibetan. You showed Tibetan textbooks. But people actually said on Twitter, Sean, you're lying. It's all a Potemkin village. It's all fake. It's all staged. You know, the government forced all 5,000 students to just be ready somehow for when I happen to just walk into a classroom on my own and say, they're learning Tibetan. I mean, that's ridiculous. Sean, I have a follow-up for you because you tweeted about what you saw and learned this past week and I noticed you have been attacked by many on Twitter. So do those hateful comments and personal attacks bother you? No, I, I think, you know, the hateful attacks on me on Twitter, for the most part, don't bother me because it's important that the truth be told. Now, I definitely have suffered professionally, but you have to be honest, you have to be objective, and I feel that I'm lucky. I'm able to be able to show the rest of the world, what's really happening in China. But it does impact me when some friends, when some family, you know, don't believe me. Um, you know, they'll sit there and say, well, the New York Times writes this about Tibet, so you're obviously lying, Sean. Because it's just you against New York Times. It's hard, you know, it's me against the New York Times. What's weird to me is a lot of Americans will say, the New York Times is fake news, except for when it comes to China. And that's, it's a conversation I have almost weekly. And so when I've been tweeting about my trip here, I did have someone who's known me since I was a baby message me and was not, I would say, polite in how he had discussed my tweets. And I'm not sure he's ever been to Tibet. I'm not sure he's ever, he speaks Chinese, but he was willing to criticize without knowing. And that's a big problem is the lack of understanding between what's happening on the ground. So Sean, I would like to keep asking, what motivates you to keep defending China on so many issues? I think what motivates me is to get the truth out there. It's not necessarily about defending China, it's about saying what's really happening on the ground in Tibet and the rest of China, so that the rest of the world knows China's government and the Chinese people aren't evil. I want the truth to get out there. And the reality is, is the government's doing a really good job right now. Um, that, that to me is the key because I've always wanted to be a bridge between the United States and China because I feel that the whole world wins if China is successful and the United States is successful and they cooperate together. I'm really frustrated and saddened and worried about not just a cold war, but you know, a hot war 
emerging between the United States and China because people in DC are just hysterical about China's growth. You know, anytime I say anything good about China, I get attacked. The truth has to get out there, and that's why I keep doing what I do. So guys, as foreigners living in China for many years and after spending a week here, what would you say are the common misunderstandings or misperceptions about Tibet? There are a huge number. Um, one problem is, there's, there's, we just talked about, there's some narrative in the press that's negative about it. There are also honest mistakes. China changes so fast that anybody write, who writes a book about China, it's wrong by the time it gets published. I mean, I keep hearing, even today, I hear people say, China's development is only in a few coastal cities and the rest of it's desperately poor. People still say that and they believe it because they read it in a book. And it may have been true 20 years ago, but now we're in one of the remote, most remote areas of China. There's a lot of development here. So things change so fast. It's such a dynamic economy that people need to realize that China's changing, China's developing. One thing I would recommend for the rest of the world is, well, at least for my own country. I, I'm an American, I love the United States. One of the reasons I, I want people to understand what's really going on in China is that the United States has wasted so many resources over the last 20, 30, 40, 50 years getting into stupid wars and, and pushing for changes in other countries that we don't understand where we should be concentrating on our own problems. We need a lot of transformation in the United States and we should be focusing on that. And one of the things that drives me crazy is that the United States, the median real wage, average wages of average people have not gone up in 40 years. You've had a massive transformation of wealth going from labor to capital over the last 40 years. We need to concentrate on fixing that uh, rather than trying to somehow fix China or fix Myanmar or fix any place in the world. I think one of the biggest misconceptions people have about Tibet is that the everyday Tibetan is oppressed, that they can't practice their religion. I think we clearly saw pilgrims, you know, going to the most holy sites in Tibetan religion. And I think that there's a misconception that Tibetans aren't optimistic. I think when you talk to younger Tibetans, they clearly are optimistic and they have a can-do attitude. They have the, you know, they feel like they can realize anything. They can buy that car in the future, they can get educated, they can buy that home, they can provide for their families. You know, I interviewed that boy who's 27 years old and he goes, I want to be able to open up my own hotel in the next five, 10 years. So it's that optimism that happiness with their lives and their future is something that I think of people, and I certainly myself, didn't quite understand about Tibet until I came here in the last week. I was expecting a much more downtrodden population than what I saw. Lots of optimism here, it's great. So do you guys foresee hope that in the future more people outside China will understand what the central government and many other places across China have been doing for the Tibetans and for the region? Unfortunately, I'm pessimistic about the world. There's an overarching narrative which is going to be very hard for, for China to overcome. My recommendation for the world is calm down, don't get into any mess or don't get into any fights. And uh, if China will continue to grow over the next 20 years, if it's able to maintain peace and stability and economic reforms, and by then the world will be a different place. I think it's going to be difficult for China to overcome the false narrative that's in the Western press and in coming out of governments. Now they gotta keep trying. They have to do more shows like yours to really show the real Tibet or the real China to the rest of the world. They have to and communicate in a way that Westerners understand. But I think it's gonna be tough. You know, you had the Trump regime was attacking China all the time. There was a real chance for Biden to reset relations. He had a chance to come back and say, you know what, everybody calm down. We need to find win-win situations with China. But on day one, when Biden became president, you saw Tony Blinken, the Secretary of State, said, yeah, I agree, um, China's committing genocide, which is a very loaded term. You saw that Catherine Tai, the um, trade minister, or trade secretary, is saying we're gonna keep a lot of the economic sanctions 
on China. You know, you've seen that Huawei and a lot of the top tech companies in China are still being hampered and really hurt by the United States and their sanctions. We had an opportunity under Biden, and he's really disappointed me, to reset relations. But now you've got a Trump regime and maybe a Biden regime. Republicans and Democrats alike are going to have eight years, minimum, where they're going to scapegoat China for all of America's ills. And when you have that combined with the Western media creating a false narrative, it's very hard to all of a sudden turn around if you're a political leader in the U.S. and say, we need to have good relations with China. More important is I think people really don't know what life is like in China. This is a hard thing to convey to people around the world. But when I first came here, I didn't really know what it was like. I think life in China is very nice and people have good lives here. And just conveying that, what normal life is like, is something that people in the West do not understand. And shows like yours and others, it's important for people to get a, a view of how nice life can be and how optimistic people might be and how the young people, very energetic young people, many of them. And there are a lot of, a lot of people who are very admirable, you know, poor people, building businesses, changing their lives. This is an admirable lifestyle. And I don't think people in the West have any understanding of that. Now, it's gonna be very hard to convey that because I've lived here for five years. I'm seeing it, but most people cannot see it at all. So if they see five minutes on the news at night that's critical of China, that's all they believe because that's all they know. So that's something, you know, I think shows like yours have the ability to really change the perspective of Westerners, right? You can get guests like us, you know, well-spoken narrator, you know, hosts like you, and you can show the good of Tibet, but also like we did some of the poorer people. That's a really important um, story that China's media and China's government needs to get out into the world, the good and the bad. Yeah, that's why we insisted that we have to go to places that are not nice yet. And, you know, like I said, I want to be a bridge. You know, I've been posting on LinkedIn um, my, you know, my experiences here. I think it's the last three um, assistant secretary of states for East Asia in, from the United States are all connected to me and they're seeing all of my updates. And, you know, the, the heads of the military in the U.S. are all seeing my updates. So I'm hoping through shows like yours and more backroom meetings that we're going to be able to calm tensions down. But I'm still relatively pessimistic. So the other thing I was wondering when I watched those videos on YouTube about Tibet, I was thinking who really cares about the Tibetans here? So do you guys have any answers to that one? Look, people around the world don't wake up in the morning thinking about what's happening in Tibet. Um, they have very little information about it. I mean, people care about their own lives and their own people and their own country first. I think the only reason we pe hear people in the West pay attention to Tibet is because they can use it as a way of criticizing China. That's the main reason they actually care about Tibet. I don't think people really care about people on the other side of the world in any case. Very seldom do they really care. I think mostly intervention around the world is for strategic reasons rather than so-called humanitarian reasons. I think people want to feel good about themselves. And so they want to fight for the rights of people that they think are being hurt. And I think when it comes to Tibet, it's really not based off of actual knowledge. The 14th Dalai Lama, when he left Tibet, you know, he was paid about 1.7 million US dollars a year from the US government. And they pay that for a very long period. So the US government did that to try to destabilize China. The Dalai Lama did this because he was able to get a lot of money. So, you know, he hobnobs with Hollywood stars like Richard Gere. And when you have that, it makes everyday people say, I want to fight for the Tibetans, even though they don't really know what's going on. Thanks, John. So looking forward, what challenges do you foresee here? And where do you think Tibet is heading? Well, the biggest challenge is finding a viable business model for Tibet. This is normal for any other, any other place in the world. They have to find things that are economically viable for them to do. I think that's the most, the most challenging thing. Uh, I have a lot of optimism from what I've seen. That, and I see a lot of people developing their own grassroots businesses, some big, some small, and that's the way of development. So I, I, I think it's working is, 
is my view of the economy here. But at some point, it's going to have to wean itself off of support from the rest of China. And guys, what suggestions would you offer to help secure a brighter future for this region? Well, from what I've seen, you keep doing what you've been doing. Further investment, further giving people opportunities, I think that's the most important thing. Just, it's like what David said, just do what they're doing. They've clearly gotten a good toolkit of policies, and this toolkit's working. So you just have to keep doing it. Just keep reform, keep opening up, keep letting other Chinese and foreigners know Tibet's really a nice place to be. Thank you so much. And thank you so much, guys, for joining our show. Thank Thanks you. a lot. Thank you. Thank you.